Hanrag, um, who's come to speak to us about uh, the Longu people of the Solomon Islands. Um, there has uh, many and diverse um, research interests, but uh, in particular, she, she did her PhD on aspects of the Longu people and their language. Um, she studied many, many diverse aspects from sort of socio-cultural aspects, um, such as folkloric stories, as well as publishing and grammar, as well as more um, linguistic analytical uh, topics like transcripts and valence. And um, I think this talk is going to be super interesting for this combining aspects of culture and language, um, how socio-cultural knowledge impacts on uh, the structure of the language. Um, so let's welcome Devon Hill. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, and um, it's very nice to be here. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing you to the woman on the, in the picture on the screen. Um, her name is Alice Votaya, and she's, she's a woman from uh, Nangali village in Longu district, Guadalcanal. And she's just finished um, weaving the basket called the Pera basket, which she has on her head. And the reason that she has it on her head is because she's showing that it's ready now to, for use. So one of the key things that, as an outsider, um, I've been aware of um, going into the Longu community is the fact that women carry things on their heads. Um, but what I'm going to do today is to talk about the domain of carrying um, in the sense that it's a very, I think, culturally salient domain for this community. And also um, address, if you like, some contributions perhaps that looking at um, domains or action verb domains um, that include a variety of lexically specific verbs where often there's a close association between the verb and the object and therefore the cultural impact um, to sort of ask the question is there something that dom domains such as this have to offer the broader uh, sort of um, lexical semantic sort of um, issues. Um, so that's sort of what I'm going to do today. Let me start, or let me move on then, to sort of give a bit of context as to, from a um, linguistic point of view, why I think this area is interesting. I mean, culturally, I think it's interesting because it's something that's easy to observe and something that over time, I, as I've come to understand it, I realise is quite um, significant to the, to the community. In other words, the, the, the basket itself is significant and, in fact, the fact that um, women carry things on their head is in a way emblematic of, of their communities. So in other words, they identify themselves as a group where women carry things on their heads, whereas around them um, other communities don't do that. So it's, it's kind of got that kind of identity issues as well. But from a lexical semantics perspective, um, one of the sort of contexts for this is that there has been quite a lot of work on action verb domains um, cross-linguistically. Most notably and sort of influentially, if you like, is work on cutting and breaking. And, um, but there's also been work on the domains of eating and drinking and carrying. And I'll say just a little bit about those. Um, but within that work, which was, if you like, done um, from an extensional point of view and sort of basically through the Max Planck Institute of linguistics, um, it struck me that the, the languages that they seemed to find most interesting were the ones where they could see what the comparisons and similarities were. Where they came across languages which had these, if you like, large groups of verbs that were very lexically specific and related to the culture, it seemed like they were the kind that we kind of have to ignore because they don't seem to say as much for us about cross-linguistic issues. So let me sort of see if, if there is something to say, I guess. Um, on the other hand, it was also, it's also been acknowledged by anybody who's worked in that area that these lexically specific verbs um, do reflect material culture and cultural practices. So work by Penny Brown, for example, um, work by Heath and McPherson on Dogon, a work by um, Steve Levinson and, and so on. So, so that, that's very clear that, that there is this relationship when you have lexically specific verbs that there is this relationship between material culture and cultural practices. But as I said, what I think, um, at least as far as I'm aware, is, is somewhat missing is um, you know, to see whether or not these 
these domains in fact have some kind of coherence or pattern themselves. In other words, it's not just a random group of, of words that each one you need to know in, in terms of the culture, but is there something more going on? Obviously I'm going to suggest there is, at least for the work, the, the, the domain that I've looked at in Longu. Um, a little bit about the language, but not too much. Um, I've put on your handout, so you have a handout as, which is not the same as, as, the, um, as the PowerPoint and, and on the handout there we'll start with just some language notes but I've also included a list of the verbs of carrying and then a couple of texts and references uh, which are partly for your reference and if you want to ask me questions but I won't go through in great detail but anyway but um, so you can look at a few more language notes on your handout but for our purposes it's really um, mostly just to understand where the language is spoken, which is um, on Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. It's an Oceanic Austronesian language. There are currently around 3,000 speakers. When I first went there um, two decades ago, um, there were about 1,500 speakers. So the number of speakers has increased, but as with many parts of Melanesia, the number of speakers, the increase in the, in the number of speakers doesn't necessarily mean that the language has become stronger, more that the language of wider communication, in this case Solomon's Pidgin, um, is kind of part of their, their life. But, but um, Longu is definitely spoken every day in the villages. It's definitely transmitted you know, to children. And schooling is in English. Um, but there is a move, in fact there is a, a national languages policy from the Solomon Islands government um, that says that vernacular languages will begin to be used but they haven't yet implemented that policy but still they definitely have that as a, as a goal. Um, in terms of its location, I don't know if I can point, um, but these are the many islands of uh, the Solomons and Longu is spoken here on the main island of Guadalcanal and the, the capital is Honiara. Nevertheless, it's relatively remote because there are no roads. So, um, in fact, there's not quite the loss of language that there might be for some for the language that's right next door to it. Again, you can ask me about that later, but um, just to give you some context. Um, I also want to say that there is a paper that I've written. It's um, under review at the moment, so it's not published, but it covers a broader. Um, it covers more things than I'm going to cover in the talk. Um, one of the things that I've in, that's in the paper that's not in the talk is a more deep discussion of lexical semantics of the verbs. However, I'm quite happy to make the paper available to you, anyone who's interested in that or if you have follow-up questions. So, so it's, I will talk a little bit about the lexical semantics and feel free to ask me more about it. But what I'll concentrate on is two, um, two particular aspects of this sort of broad topic. And firstly, um, to say that give you the reasons why I believe this um, semantic domain is culturally salient and therefore sort of worthy of, of study if you like, um, but also to suggest that there's, um, there is an organising principle of the domain. I'm not sure that organising principle is the best term, but what I want to convey is that it's not a random group of, of verbs um, that, that just are about the culture, that there's something, there is some sort of coherence that's understood um, in terms of the cultural prominence of, of a particular verb, and that verb is the verb to carry on the head, sungia, and it's um, carry on the head, as I've said, um, is, is done just by women, and also the close relationship between carrying on the head and this particular basket called the pera basket. So I'm going to say something about that, although I should um, emphasize that it's not just that kind of basket that they carry on their head, it's just that that's a very important one. Um, so, on your, uh, well, so I'll talk a little bit about the verbs of carrying. As far as I can see, um, there are about 12 verbs of carrying in the language. It's not a formal grammatical class. Um, in other words, they differ according to things like transitivity, um, the way they behave in terms of uh, directional particles, which are common in oceanic languages, uh, in the way they behave in terms of reduplication, and also in the use of prepositional phrases following them. So there are, some, there are definitely uh, grammatical differences. So it's not that that tells us that it's a, a formal grammatical class, but it's a, sem a semantic domain that we can recognize. And I'll say a bit more about that as well. Also, there's no generic verb carry. So this is one of the things in a lot of the work on um, action verb domains, the question of, is there a generic verb and then sort of, if you like, um, verbs that are a sort of taxonomic relationship or is it, is it different? There's certainly not a verb to carry in, in, in Longu, but there is a more general verb, andea, which you could, which can be glossed as take. 
but it's not, um, it doesn't have a sense of dioxys without the dire directional particles. I'll leave that for you to ask me about later because I've got some literature on that as well. So it's a kind of non dioctic take, if you like, that certainly can be used when there's not a specific, say, material object or a specific reason to indicate what way something's carried. And I I've discussed that in the paper, but I won't discuss that now. Um, here's the list of um, longer verbs of carrying. And what, what you'll see is that I've just glossed them. These are by no means definitions, just glosses. But what I do want to say um, about this list is that, um, in fact, it was Andy Pauley who first said something to me when I gave a talk about this a couple of years ago, that um, this is quite a common thing in Austronesian languages to have, say, say, perhaps between 10 and 20 verbs of verbs of carrying is quite common ac across Austronesian languages. In the language that he was working on, uh, Y and Fiji, and there were 20. So L Longu is definitely not at the upper limit. Um, however, interestingly, or relevantly, um, they didn't have a verb to carry on their head. And he made the point initially, I mean, he was quite clear about this, and it's obvious to all of us, I think, that, that therefore, just because there are a lot of verbs, still you need a culture to decide what kind of verbs are we going to use. So the, the Wayan Fijian people didn't have a reason, if you like, to carry things on their head. The Longu people do. We have a verb in one language, but not the other. Uh, to follow up on this point about Austronesian languages, I put a, a sort of a request out in the, about a month ago, um, or less, uh, asking people if they had information about verbs, um, a verb in their language that meant carry on the head. And I got responses about that, as well as people giving me lists of, of, of words. And just to give you an idea of how widespread the idea of a, a, a set of, of, of verbs related to carrying is in Austronesian, um, I had people responding from, I won't give all the name of the languages, but just the areas. Um, the Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu, where they, they said they had between 10 and 20 verbs of carrying. So it's quite a sort of common thing um, in, in this language family. And there's also, um, the Proto-Austronesian does have a verb that's been reconstructed to carry on the head. So it also seems, and this is um, Pauli's um, point, too, that this is something that's been um, important in Austronesian culture sort of from the beginning. So definitely worth following up on. Um, to say a little bit about the glosses, um, and this, this if you like, I won't, I'll just wanted to say this so you don't think I'm just sticking with the glosses and saying that's enough. In the paper I, d I, I developed that in much greater detail, um, but just for today I've left it that. But I wanted to give you some idea of, of where I went with the, with the lexical semantics of, of the verbs um, and, w and where I began, if you like. And so I did start with Talmy's view of what, of what a transport verb was, and he includes carry in English as a transport verb. And so he describes transport verbs as those that share qualities that express an agent's using a body part to move or position an object. You'll see from the list that I've given you that all of those verbs involve a body part. Um, they say nothing, and I'm not going to say anything t today about whether it's motion or position that's involved, and yet that's a very important question. It's not something that one should assume, but I'm not talking about that today. And um, notes to, notice too that he talks about an agent. And from, for my purposes, um, agent is too general and it's too, if you like, reminiscent or, or important in terms of grammar. But for the semantics, I'm thinking, I think we need to talk about the carrier as opposed to just the agent. Um, and that becomes important because I'm going to argue that for some verbs, the lexical semantics entails the gender of the carrier. So it's not just somebody carries it, but a woman carries or a man carries, just for some of the verbs. Uh, that might be something people argue about or would like to argue with me, but that's what I'm going to um, suggest based on the data I have. Um, so, but nevertheless, as it says there in the um, overhead on the, PP, the PowerPoint, um, these glosses are still very relevant because they, they give us a starting point of, of the shared characteristics that we're looking at for a particular domain. And as I said, we can see that in the glosses we have, ex um, each, each of the verbs says something about a body part. Um, some of them, or if we can divide the, the list up into two if you like, and see that some verbs select for human objects, so there are many verbs that refer to ways of carrying children, and the others refer to ways of carrying, I think probably it's better to say non-humans rather than inanimates, because you can, they can carry pigs on shoulders and you could carry a cat and a dog and so on. Um, but anyway, so it's a, there is that selection and, and there are specific words for ch ways of carrying children. 
Um, and a couple, but only a couple, say something about the manner in which something is carried. So, for example, some verbs refer to or relate to ways of something hanging. Now, of course, these are very general terms. They're never going to do in terms of lexical semantics, but they're a start. And that's so we're just at that starting point. Um, what I'd like to now go through is the reasons that I, aside from the, um, the obvious um, Austronesian data in terms of the, uh, this domain of carrying being significant in a, in a wide number of languages, in Austronesian languages and historically as well, um, from a longer perspective, why I think it's a very um, salient domain. Um, I said, first of all, that there's no verb to carry, but there is a verb, zambe, meaning to not carry. And I consider that to be quite important because it's sort of saying we assume people will be carrying things. And indeed, as I said, there's no, there are no roads in that area, there are no bicycles, wheelbarrows, no kind of other means other than people. So it's not surprising that, that people have to sort of take part and participate by on their body moving things or, or, or with children holding things. Um, in some of Felix Amaker's work, he's talked about salience or one of the characteristics or wa ways of saying something salient is, is to do with the number of lexical items and the frequency of use, and that's very clear in Longu. Um, I do understand that the term salience is used differently by different sorts of groups, so I'm just trying to give you a definition that I think works for what um, I'm doing. Um, it's not, a, not saying that other definitions don't work for other things. Uh, there's also ample evidence in terms of narrative texts um, to show that that the longer people are paying attention to the way people carry things and so for example um, on your handout uh, oh, sorry perhaps we can start with number three on your handout where there's a text there I don't have to go through it but you can but you can see perhaps just look at the English gloss where it's a story about two boys observing a girl who in fact is not a girl but a spirit, but trying to work out is she from our village, is she one of us or not? And one of the ways in which um, they identify her as being just not of their community, they're not, they don't know that she's a spirit, is by the fact that she doesn't know how to carry, carry this particular basket on her head. So I think this kind of sort of uh, text evidence is very useful in supporting the fact that you see people doing it all the time. But if someone's not doing it, both they've got this word saying not carry, but also it's kind of like they can't be, our, you know, they can't be um, part of us. Um, and, and, they, and in that text, they use the verb zambe, not carrying anything, as well as you can see in the first line, the verb sungia, to carry on the head. So that would be the key way that women should carry things. That also indicates that. Um, other, kinds, other ways in which narrative texts highlight the um, importance of, of carrying or under, knowing the right way to carry the right thing um, comes in text four. This is kind of an interesting text for me because um, I was given it, or at least the, the woman whose name was Lula uh, gave it to me a long time ago when I first went there. And I didn't pay that much attention to it really, except it was a nice, I did in grammatically, but not in terms of what it was saying, because in fact it was about contact. It was about contact between Europeans and the Longview people. And so it wasn't a sort of traditional story, you know. But, um, and, um, but in that story, I liked the story a lot, it was quite a funny story because, and it focused on the fact that this boy went to, was it considered a lazy boy, went to work on the plantation and was paid in all of these different ways with a sixpence and butter and a cat. And the humour came from the fact that he never knew how to carry them home, so he'd lose them. He'd melt the butter, he'd drown the cat, he'd, you know, all of these things. And, and this little section you've got now is, because they told him to carry, I think, the bag of rice on his shoulder, which he, which he hadn't done, he dragged that and lost the rice, the next day they gave him a horse and he said, OK, I must carry the horse on my shoulder, which of course, tremendous strength, which was kind of the punchline because then he was in great favour, he was so strong, right? But anyway, but so this, this idea of humour being based on whether or not um, people understand the appropriate way to carry the appropriate thing is also a kind of evidence of um, the fact that they're attending to this, that the, the longer people are attending to whether and how people are carrying things. And the last, so that, that text, um, you know, was in my kind of vintage text for me in a sense, but a more recent text um, was, ca came a uh, descriptive text um, based on document d documentation work I've done in the last couple of years about weaving. And one of the things I asked uh, some people to do after we'd, we'd had a dictionary um, 
sort of workshop and several days of that and then we had a morning where people wove things, wove items and then some of them I recorded them describing the item that they'd woven. And if you look at number five on your handout, um, you'll see that the man um, Titus Sikwa of Nangali village, he starts describing the basket that he's just woven and it's a much longer text than this but part of what he says is not just it's made of coconut leaf or this is how I di did it but then he says um, towards the end um, the para basket is um, a very important, is, is, is an important basket for us. Um, it's something that we put things into. It's um, it's woven, or it's, 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 yeah, it's woven so that women can carry it on their head. In other words, there's this really, like, here's a basket. It's not just do what you want with it. It's woven so that women can carry it on their head, and it's an important cultural artifact. So I'm going to say more about that important, cult the important cultural nature of it um, as we go, but I just wanted to sort of point out that unbidden, as it were, people are highlighting the fact that um, how people carry things is important and also that, that uh, some, th this relationship between material object and carrying is also important. Um, and again, that's not news, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's relevant to my discussion. Okay, in addition to this linguistic evidence, uh, there's also non-linguistic evidence. Um, from an outsider's perspective, that's me, uh, you can look at photographs, many photographs that either, either I've taken um, but, um, or were taken in the 1930s by Ian Hoban who was an uh, anthropologist who worked there for a short time but he worked in many places in the Pacific. He took wonderful photos and there are many, many photographs of um, people carrying things and women carrying things on their head but boys or men carrying other things on their shoulder and it's always a specific, not always, it's, it's, but specific objects are certainly carried in specific ways in addition to other things that, like firewood and so on that, that are carried in, in the male or female way. Uh, there's also video evidence from the documentation project. Uh, again, going back to that photograph I put up at the beginning, that was also videoed, not necessarily that photo, but because she wove things a couple of times. And at the end of the process, within the video, that's exactly what she does, brings it up and puts it on her head and sort of to show that it's ready. So I think there's quite a bit of outsider perspective, non-linguistic evidence to say it's very important, especially this link between carrying on the head and this particular kind of basket. But from the insider's perspective, it's also there. Um, I, was in, I am involved in an interdisciplinary project um, with a colleague in Ca at Canberra um, about which is a, is a focuses on Ian Hoban's um, photographic collection um, in Sydney University. And in 2012, two Longu people came to view those photographs and um, both so that they could take the photographs or have access to the photographs and they were given them digitally and, and hard copy and so that we could think about how to use them but also to help the archives and the university to uh, catalogue them because they weren't completely catalogued and from this area he t and Hoban had taken about 450 um, photographs. The two people that came, one uh, Florence Watepura and the other um, a chief, Stuart Bungana, at one point, one of the photographs that was put up was of women carrying firewood on their back, on their back. And Florence said, that's not Longu. That's not how we carry. That can't be of the Longu area. And of course, that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me. Things started to sort of, um, you know, come into place as saying, oh, wow, she's really, that's, it's, it's actually very, very important. So they were able to dismiss maybe 50 photographs as being of um, an area beyond Longu in, in the bush area uh, that he had taken. And it's not the only, that wasn't the only thing they could identify, by the way, as being not of their area. But I thought that fact that the women are not carrying things in the way we carry things, it's not, it's not a photograph of us, even though it was taken in 1933. She's very con confident about that. So I think that insider perspective as well as outsider's perspective is quite a sort of valuable contribution to the linguistic evidence that we have about the salience of the domain and the importance of, of um, the cultural importance. Um, so I have to apologise to the woman in this photo because these things make you look rather wide. She's not <laughs> so wide. But um, I, also, I also wanted to um, sort of, um, I'm going to say something about, um, about, the, uh, about the ritual elements or the, the, the bride price event and this basket. But this photograph illustrates 
that this is the pair of basket again that and you can see that she's well she's carrying it on her head but also what is she carrying just vegetables and things from the garden so it's a, it's a it's something that's used in everyday life as well as um, as in, in in the ritual events in terms of the bride price event so I do think that this uh, way of carrying and especially this basket is a marker of identity for longer women and um, as it happens, it's not the only area in the world where ways of carrying are considered a sort of emblematic or sort of markers of identity distinguishing one group for another. So Stuart McGill and Robert, um, Roger, sorry, because let me change my glasses, Roger Blench um, in 2012 um, noted a similar situation in Nigeria um, for the Western Kainji women, if I've got that right, who carry things on their shoulders as an important marker of ethnicity. So in that particular area, ca women carrying things on their shoulder was considered that sets you apart from other women. In the Guadalcanal area, the carrying on the head uh, is, is what sets the Longu people apart from some other of their geographical neighbours. So it's obviously uh, not unique, but um, worth uh, noting, I think. Right, so, so far I've gone through the, um, if you like, the, the salience of the semantic domain and, and you can see that I've talked quite a lot about the culture and I think that now I'd like to sort of move on to uh, this idea that within the domain there is an organising principle and as I say, maybe it's not the best phrase, but I'm not quite sure what other phrase to use just at the moment. Um, and th this organising principle um, certainly is Folk, um, results from the fact that one particular verb is the most culturally prominent verb within this domain and I've given you sort of explanations to some extent about it. Um, the idea of a domain that has an as what I and I think we can call this an asymmetrical pattern in other words the idea that some verbs are more prominent than others and that we need to pay attention to them in order to understand the whole domain and when it comes to looking at the the specifics of lexical semantics, there's also more that it has an impact in that area as well, uh, which as I said, I won't go into now, but, but this idea of it, there being an asymmetrical pattern is one that's also been um, identified before in the area of kinship terminology by John Haviland. So he, um, for, um, in, in, again, in one of the language documentation journals, 2006, um, he described the uh, Tzotzil kinship terminology as being asymmetrical rather than sort of and being a better reflection of the culture than looking at diagrams where every kind of person and relationship is somehow equal. And um, in other words, it's just a kind of, um, what's the word, generational or other kinds, of, other kinds of sort of relationships. He sort of talked about the fact that when you have a prominent, a prominent um, kinship term, then really the way in which you describe that, it's, he described it as an asymmetrical model and that that reflects much better what's going on in the culture. And that's exactly what I think is going on here. Um, I've talked primarily about the role of, of women and by the way, this is a matrilineal society, so it's maybe, you know, again, that feeds into what, um, to the discussion. Um, but there is also one of the verbs is, um, the, the first verb on the list of verbs of carrying, ango inia, to carry on the shoulder, is a verb that is associated with men. Women don't carry things on their shoulders. Um, so one thing we can also say in terms of asymmetry is that we kind of have a pair here of, that, that sort of refer to ways in which men and women carry things. In both cases, they relate to uh, something being supported. So they're both verbs of support as opposed to hanging. So again, we sort of see that this asymmetry, we start to see an internal, a kind of internal patterns that where we've got pairs or, or, or groups of, of verbs that behave in some way in relation, complement one another or, or a sort of a lexical set within the, the larger le lexical set. I won't say too much more about that now. So um, I've touched on some of these things before, but um, one point in particular I need to sort of emphasise. So what we have in the way of linking the idea of material culture, cultural practices and modes of carrying is the fact that we have a particular basket that's made for women to carry on their head. We have the verb sungya, to carry on their head, uh, which I argue entails um, in its meaning that a woman is the carrier, but despite the fact that it's often associated with that, that pair of baskets must be carried on their head, um, 
the object is not entailed in its meaning. It's kind of the other way round. To define a noun, I think, to, to define the noun pera, you have to refer to the verb sungia, but to define the verb sungia, you don't have to define, to include the term pera, that is, in, if you like, encyclopedic information. But you do have to refer to the fact that it's a woman carrying it. Now, of course, another piece of information that um, you know, shows these connections is that there is um, a heterosomous relationship between the verb sungia and the noun sungi. In other words, there's a concept, there's a formal, uh, they look the same except one's a verb and one's a noun. And, um, and there's a conceptual relationship between the two. And that is that sungi, which is, refers to bride price feast, um, at that event, the pera basket is used to transfer the shell money or, and the cash or the custom money from the groom's family to the bride's family. So here, as I said, there is a ritual function or a <coughs> ritual sort of element to the importance of the pera basket and it has to be carried on the head and it is related to this bride price exchange. So all of a sudden you can see this picture of, of the sort of centrality of the carrying on the head, the basket, the women and so on. But I also don't want to say that there's no role for men in this, um, both this event or this uh, uh, culture by any means. And um, that, that also anguinia, carry on the shoulders, it both entails in its meaning the fact that a man is the one who's carrying something. And it, by the way, it could be one man or two, like poles between two shoulders or, or, sing, sing, or, or carrying something singly. Um, and also that's an important part of the event as well, as well. And I'll show you a couple of pictures that show that. Um, so here is, um, this was a, not a really big bride price feast, but it just happened to occur at the time we were doing the dictionary um, workshop, so I was able to go. And so in the picture on your, on the left, on this side of the wall, <laughs> uh, you can see that, it's, that it, men are counting out the, the shell money. So that's those long strings of things, that are custom money, and um, they're working out, okay, how many do we have to give this time, because there was an earlier part of the, um, bride price exchange uh, where, where some would have been given. So that's the men are doing that. At the same time, the women, women are doing other things um, related to, that are to the putting things into the basket and cr uh, creating these sort of garlands and so on for the bride and groom to wear on, on the head. But you'll see in the, um, in the um, picture on the, the right side that, that there again in, in the photo is the pera basket. So that's the basket that's been used to once the money's been counted and once the cash has been given it's handed over in this particular basket. So there's this ritual element as well. On the same day you can see that, so the same event, you can see that men are carrying the pig um, on their shoulders. So again, that's a common way to do that. But that's important too. No good, even if you could do it some other way, if you came into the event uh, where the, the, and women were carrying it or you were carrying it in some other way with your hands, for example, that wouldn't do. It has to be done in this way. What, so clearly there's, um, and this has been mentioned before in terms of other, um, in other languages for action verbs, clearly there is an association between the kinds of objects that are carried and how they're carried, there's a kind of real world association between what makes sense to carry in certain ways. But I want you to notice both the photograph and then hopefully I did have it on the, um, yep, on, on your handout. So in the photograph on this side, you can see that both men and women are carrying the same things. It's a kind of roughly hewn <coughs> basket, a different kind, that's just got um, things like yams or sweet potatoes in it. But these are also presented as part of the bride price feast or for the bride price feast. But you see that women have them on their head and the men on their shoulders. So it's not just about the objects, it's, it is actually about the gender. And if you look at your handout in number six, there's a short um, text on the bottom of page three where men and women are carrying the same things, the same objects. They're carrying coconuts that have been tied together. Um, but the men, um, the men angoi, they, they carry it on their shoulder and the women sungi, okay, they carry it on their heads. So just this kind of evidence that it's not just about, it's, there's definitely an association between the carrying and the material objects, but it's not, that's not the key thing. The key thing is the gender. Um, so, um, if you like, sort of summarising in a sense some of the things I've just said, there has been quite a bit of work, especially in cutting and breaking, for cutting and breaking, breaking verbs, where this association between verbs and material objects has been identified. 
Um, Penny Brown's noted that for some cutting and breaking verbs, the verb is only applicable to one kind of object. That's not the case in Longu. I'd say there's a close association, but it's not, um, not the case that there's just one verb, one object. But one, um, so, so that's just that point. Um, but one point I, or one sort of thing I think that some of this work, uh, this research can sort of help us take further is Taylor's question, also was a, that was a summary paper at the end of the volume on cutting and breaking verbs, is the question, what is the role of, the, of material culture um, in a language community in the lexicalization of a domain? I think it's a very worthwhile question and one that we should sort of pay attention to. As I said, for, I think for the Longu people, um, in terms of defining um, the nouns or the objects, the, the, the nouns that refer to the objects, we do need to refer, we do need to include something about the action of, of, of um, the way in which they're used, but it doesn't work in the other, the other way. In other words, the verbs are not primary. Semantically, the verbs are not primary. That's what I would say about this domain at least. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. Not, uh, so, Another thing that I did, and, and you can see this um, in, in the paper, I can just give you a couple of points. Another thing that I did was to ask people, well, when it comes to particular verbs, um, verbs of carrying, in your mind, are there particular objects associated with them? And so in uh, the, the far left side, the object referred to the object that they, the objects that they identified, um, were, were given. So the para was the first one, the para basket for carrying on the head, but there were also other kinds of feasting bowls um, called a lali, and also the woven pad sukai that's used to sort of support a heavy something above, above it. So these were the primary things, and they're clearly culturally specific, that were associated with carrying on the head, and only women would do that. But it doesn't mean that there aren't also other things. Um, for men carrying things on the shoulders, the things that they said were most likely to be carried in that way were sticks, meaning the poles that, for the pigs, um, heavy bags, so obviously there's a, a sort of a physical aspect of these things that are heavy, and also baskets and bowls that, that can't be hung over your shoulder. Um, there's, I, won't, I won't go through them all, but just to, to say that there's a verb, caver, caveria, um, which is used for various kinds of baskets that have strings so they can be carried over the shoulder. And in that sense, they're culturally specific because they're locally made items. But it doesn't mean that they don't use the same verb for if, for example, someone in town got a European sort of bag that could be hung over their shoulder, same verb. So it's not making that kind of sti distinction. But it is worth noting that both men and women can carry things hung from their shoulder but only men carry things um, supported from their shoulder. And as I said, um, uh, there are many or a number of verbs that refer to ways of carrying children, and both men and women carry children in all of those ways. So there's no sort of prescribed male or female way of carrying a baby or a child. And there's also photographic evidence to support that. Um, OK, I just thought I'd give you a couple of nice pictures. Um, here, just to sort of show you the um, one kind of basket called a kero pub basket, which is primarily for fishing. And so you can see that it's made as a kind of, in a canonical shape so that the fish can be put in there easily. It can be used as they're fishing to, to, to put the catch in, but it's also something that can be hung up outside the house. And it's also got a small strap that can be used on a shoulder as well. So this link between the way things are made and how they're carried is an obvious one um, as, as well. Um, Summarising really here, um, so I do think that we can argue within this domain of verbs of carrying that um, in addition to those glosses that I gave you earlier and the sort of more tell me and sort of approach to say somebody carries something on their head or whatever, that there is also for some verbs but not others a semantic selection based on the gender of the carrier in these verbs. In terms of the, um, this is important in terms of dictionary work, so making sure that a definition reflects that, that's certainly one point. But I think also that perhaps we're a little bit loath to, um, loath to admit these kind, of, these kind of examples in linguistics that it's, you know, the, the gender, we ha we're, it's quite easy to talk about 
differentiation in terms of objects, but often the, the, the subject or the agent is kind of could be anybody, but culturally not really. Culturally that's not actually um, a, re a reflection of what's going on. And therefore because not culturally, I think not semantically. Um, okay, so um, to conclude, and as I said, I've got more data on the lexical semantics and ways in which I've unpacked the, the glosses, but just to sort of conclude on these key points about the salience and then the, um, the sort of organisational sort of principle within the domain. Um, in, in studies generally on action verbs, uh, we see that most interest um, focuses, I think, of course with repercussions that are more interesting, but most interest fo focuses on whether or not a domain is sort of hierarchical, where there's a generic verb and sort of other verbs under that. Um, or non-hierarchical in some sense, um, the lexically specific verbs with no generic verb. Um, but what's kind of missing is really an understanding or a sort of deeper work into what these non-hierarchical groups of verbs might um, pattern, in what ways they might pattern. Um, so clearly for, ca for the longu and the domain of carrying, we've got evidence that it's not a taxonomic pa um, pattern, but one, but there is a pattern there, and it's based on the cultural prominence of, of a particular verb, but also the complement, complementary nature, if you like, of verb, the verb that relates to the way men carry and, and, and women carry. So this kind of, um, I think, is something that should be um, sort of attended to when, when we look at these lexically specific domains. Um, moreover, this pattern does reflect a matrilineal society where the routines of women's lives are kind of at the focus, especially in terms of the bride price event, and that has repercussions into the sort of daily event. Um, there, there certainly, we can also say that this, um, that some of the things that we can identify in terms of the, the, the way people live their, live their life, their lives, um, is also evident in, in parts of the grammar, in, in different kinds of ways. But just this idea of routines as being very important to people and being sort of embedded in the lexical semantics and so on. We see it also in the grammar in terms of things like um, it's a language that has object incorporation, so the sort of um, dig sweet potatoes, um, carve canoes, all of this kind of object incorporation type constructions um, are very evident there and there are other kinds of grammatical constructions that sort of indicate that, um, that the routines of people's lives are somehow embedded in what we see. So that's also a little bit, I've written a little bit about that in the paper as well. Um, so in summary I think there is a lot more both in Longu and in other languages to explore in terms of the kinds of patterns that do exist in, in action verb domains, um, especially when we see these lexically specific verbs that don't have a generic verb and see well what, what is going on. Um, there may be you know, a range of, of, of models that we, can, that we discover um, in terms of these domains, but I do think that an, an asymmetrical model where the sort of prominence, the cultural prominence of one or two verbs um, is one which um, is quite ev evident here and one, and we might find that other languages work in a similar way and, and in particular in Austronesian languages if it's, as it's the case, that there are so many that do have these fairly large um, domain, uh, number of verbs in the domain of carrying, but that work is yet to be done. But anyway, thank you. Okay. Um, Can I, I better put my acknowledgements. <laughs> so I, I think it's very important to thank especially the women of Longu, um, people who've helped me and who work there and, and um, that I've uh, sort of learnt a lot from but, um, and share their, um, their understanding of the culture and the language with me and also to the Hans Rousing Endangered Language Project as it was funding from that project that supported this research. So thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, oops. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for fascinating talk, we kept it quite short and sweet. I think we could all have probably listened to a lot more, but we've got plenty of time for questions, so that's good. Um, before I forget, um, as Deborah mentioned at the beginning of the talk, she very kindly offered to make the paper available for us if anyone wants to know more. So um, if you want to get hold of that, or if anyone didn't get a handout as well, I know you don't have enough, then um, you can email me. Um, it's rw44 at SOAS. Um, it's on the seminar website. Well. I, I can also send you the PowerPoint because okay. they kind of go together. I mean they're not the same but they kind of go okay. together. So yeah, all well, that would be available. Um, but yeah, let's uh, have some questions. I'll just go ahead and swap people. Yes. 
Hi, thank you so much. It was so interesting and so fascinating to listen to. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just had, had a small question. Um, you said that the evidence from the basket, from the caring, mm. the man of caring, um, kind of demonstrated the matrilineal type of society. But I wonder if there was any evidence to actually show that perhaps it's under, underlining, un, not, underlining the strength of men over women. Because physiologically, yeah. mm. I, I happen to know, mm. I, I can't give you mm. a reference, but mm. I did read it somewhere, that it's actually lighter, mm -hmm. it was lighter sure. to carry on the head and on the shoulder. So would, did you have any sort of ideas in regards to that? So would it okay. to show that men are stronger, but they don't have to resort to carrying on the head? Okay, so um, I think that's actually a good point. So, the, But the first one thing I just want to clarify, I, I, I didn't intend to suggest that this kind of shows a matrilineal society. Mm -hmm. What I was saying is that it is a matrilineal society and the fact that certain things are, um, are, are for example, made just for women and there are things that, that women, you know, do and it's kind of prized in a way. And in other words, it's not, it's not a men's basket that is considered to be um, emblematic of the culture. It could be because there are men, there are baskets also for men. So it's, I just think it's kind of interesting that, that it, there is that, um, I suppose, respect that that I think fits with that idea. But nevertheless, as you saw, the men counting the the um, money, men are definitely in charge um, in in the sort of everyday way. I think. I mean, land is transferred through the woman's line, but you know, it's not to say that men don't have mm -hmm. a more significant and political political role and so on. And I completely agree with you about the the, the carrying in terms of weight. That de that that um, men will carry heavier things. I can't believe how heavy some of the things that the women carry are. But nevertheless, it's obviously the men who carry the, wimp, you know, the, the really heavy things. As I said, sometimes you can't believe that women are carrying what they're carrying. But no, I think there is that gender, that, that physical difference. Mm -hmm. However, one, and this is a completely off the cuff remark, and it really should be taken as totally anecdotal. Mm -hmm. One thing I think is interesting, not, not interesting, one thing I've also observed there, because sometimes people have asked, I've been asked questions like, so how tall are people, and how do you feel, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I sort of think there's not, I think between men and women, there aren't as big, the, the differences between the average man and the average woman, woman in terms of height is not as great as in Caucasian um, groups. So I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, that's just a sort of a point about whether weight, whether how strong you are, is the biggest thing. Because women are quite strong as well. But I definitely think men are carrying the the heaviest things. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I don't think it's about putting women down. That's what I'm saying. It's not about okay, putting so women down. Just so, that's just it's not putting women down at all. But it's certainly not because they're. It's not. It's only um, in some way showing some, or having some kind of respect. But it's not also. They're not kind of like. Right above it's it's a it's a it's fa it's a, a family's tra it's a family um, what can you say a bride price event. In, there are other ways in which you, one could interpret it, it in a negative way from a Western culture, um, but one shouldn't. Um, but but yeah, so it's it's not about men or women being better, Who's but stronger? no no stronger or better or anything like that. No 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 yeah. Can I have one more question? Yeah. In the picture that you showed, compare, comparing that men and women had the same thing on their shoulder. I think I spotted a little boy there uh -huh. carrying it on his head. So is it a gender and also an age thing? Um, Did I, well, it's probably a girl. No, but it could, OK. It's it's short in the blue T-shirt, you see? OK, so we can't, can't guarantee. <laughs> Fine, then. I specifically, I was like, is that a girl? Short, yeah, okay, so it, it does look like a boy and it could be a boy. Mm. On the whole, there, on the whole, because you know, like, even though you've got, if you like, rules, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, but on the whole, you do see girls from a very young age carrying things on their head, and on the whole, you do see boys from a very young age carrying things on their shoulders. So, um, so it's, it's even from like two or three. You know, they would. It would be. They would be trained to 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 do that. It would be a, an expected thing. I I can't speak for a particular instance, as it were, but they're definitely trained to do that. So, if a person from that from that population saw this picture, they would say it's definitely a girl because they would assume it was. Yeah, I, and I have to say, clothes are hard to come by sometimes. So, if they had the boys look, show, boy yeah, shorts that are more boy-like, that wouldn't matter really. Yeah. But I'm not saying it is a girl, I just don't know. Yeah. Um, 
this is more of a cultural question. Um, and it's to follow up there. Um, do they have the same sense of gender as we do, where there's just just men and just women? There's other cultures that have multiple. Yeah. Um, let's say um, fairly much yes. Similar, very yes. Now I know in certain cultures that it's it's kind of different, and I have been. Some people have said to me, "Well, what happens in this situation or that situation?" But I think this is the expected situation um, that men do certain things and women do certain things, and the view of men and women is very much. I think it's also a Christianized country now, so I mean, you know, quite Christianized. All of the Pacific is. Um, so I can only speak for, you know, what's happening now, except to say that clearly from the 1933 photos, exactly the same kind of situations. But the gendered view is very similar. I mean, if there are some nuances as a, I, that I don't understand, that may well be the case as a linguist, even though I've worked there for qu quite a long time. Um, but it's not something I'm, I think is really, would be strong in any case, yeah. Um. So I was wondering if you managed to actually try and elicit uh, a taxonomic relationship between um, different verbs and carrying and say the genetic word for carrying or you try it or you tried it. Um, I let's say uh, I, I've I've got okay. Let's say um, I discussed it rather than tried to elicit it. So when I had the text examples, which and I had you know over time quite a lot. Then I, in, if you like, interrogated people about, well, what exactly is going on here? So, and as I said to, earlier, that there is this take verb mm. that, um, and we can, and in a similar way to English, can, um, he just took my, you know, he just took my glasses case or something. In a sense, he's, somebody's carrying it, taking it. It's not, ta it doesn't have to be take away, in other words. Um, so, there's been quite a lot of discussion about them and there isn't really, I think because of this, the links between the material objects and the ways of carrying, it's pretty clear it's not um, taxonomic. I should also add that um, uh, Cliff Goddard, in, who works, I don't know if you're familiar with the natural semantic meta-language sort of field of semantic um, analysis, argues that some of the, the in, in a sense, that taxonomic description doesn't fit any of these verbs anyway. He would argue that, or some people in certain semantic theories would argue that. So I think there's that element that they're, that they're verbs that are associated with particular um, nouns or, or objects. Um, but, but no, it's, it's been interrogated, but did I elicit it? I don't know if that would be the right word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So wondering, um, when you're talking about gender as well as yeah. women carrying on the head and men on the shoulder, what about making the actual baskets in the first yeah. place? Is that also No. Well? And that's, the, so, so there is a, there is a, in terms of, if you like, um, making things, there are some gender divides, but that particular basket, the para basket, men and women make it. And in fact, the one in number five, that, that is a man, um, Titus Sikor, that was a man who made it. The woman that I showed you at the front, Alice, um, her, she ha she's one of maybe five, and her brothers make those baskets as well. So her mother, I think it was her mother, taught all of them, and they make it, but she's kind of become the one that does most of it. But no, the men definitely can make it. Um, carving is primarily male. So uh, we also did, uh, in this interdisciplinary thing uh, project, there was um, sort of some carving workshops and various things. And while they say men carve, only men carve, it was clear that some women were helping a little bit at the edges, but they're not the primary carvers. And there's a kind, there are kind of mats that, only w that men don't make, that women make. Um, on the whole, I think that they're it's not as it's not totally prescribed, even the mats and, and the carving, but there's a strong preference for, for women to be just doing the mats, which are seen as kind of easier and, and, and things for the home and so on, and carving, which is more, more substantial and, and so on. Um, but these baskets, no, men can do that too. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I have loads of questions. Yeah, please. Um, you know with the, with the bags of care for caring that you presented, 
I mean, so uh, really I wonder with some new items that come in. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I yeah, don't, good question. I have no idea how, how <coughs> yeah. they live exactly. Do they have phones? Do they have mobile phones? Do they have oh, books? Yeah. What and what about carrying those like more modern? Yes, no, no, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. So firstly, they do now have mobile phones, but it's, it, you know, it's an area that has no electricity or toilets or no. anything like that. So, but mobile phones have become quite big in the Pacific. Um, books, yes, for school or um, Bibles or, you know, um, you know for, for the church services and so on. But there is, um, I can go to the list. I just didn't want to, you know, like, it's no point saying everything. Yeah. Uh, see this third verb down, hua, mm -hmm. that's to carry something for hanging from the head like a string basket that you might sort of hang that way. And that's a new item and it's a borrowed verb. Mm -hmm. So there is a sort of um, loss and gain, if you like, of, of language in this area when you have new items and new words. So that's, that's a borrowed verb and they didn't, and they traditionally didn't make those kind of string bags but they brought them from sort of other areas. And there's another verb that lulua, carry something on your back, that's a bit more like carrying the, um, can be used for sort of backpack type things but also like carrying wood sort of down below the lower part of your back. That isn't very, um, that, that's very infrequent. I don't have many examples of it and they say they don't use it that much. So there's, there is definitely a bit of flux in this. And then, um, as I said, if there were other new things, there's, there's, there's carry something in the hand, that could be hold in the hand, but you know, lots of things can be carried in the hand. Um, and uh, yeah, I think your point is right. When there are new things, but new things can be carried on the head, and new things can be carried on the shoulder and new things can be carried like hanging from the shoulder but there is, is this addition and loss of, of language here as well. What would they, what would they use for, for mobile phones for instance, carry, carry in the hand? Uh, most likely they would have it in a small basket so they're, they, um, they um, chew betel nut so, um, so you've got all these little baskets that have the, the betel nut lime and so on. So they, they, they often have small baskets for that and small, then they might have a similar things, slightly different shape for, um, you know, for mob mobile phones or other things. They could put it, you know, like they could put it in their pockets, sh short pockets if it was a man. Mm -hmm. um, they could carry it in their hand. But it's likely that they would actually have a basket and put it in the basket. And they would use one of those? Yes, that's right, yeah. Mm. And the other thing you could say is you, often there's, they're carrying more than one thing. So I've also, you know, especially you've got your child, you've got this, you've got something hanging from the back of your head. So and that in grammatically or sort of in terms of clause structure, there would be a kind of just coordinated clause, clauses which identify carrying, you know, a certain thing in a certain way and then carrying this in a certain way and so on. Yeah. Oh, do they use those words metaphorically at all, like shoulder <coughs> Oh, good question. Um, they, I can't think of what the phrase is. They have words, they have phrases that are, if you like, metaphoric that refer to those kinds of things. And I haven't come across them in relation to verbs of carrying. Mm. So, um, th except they do, but the word shoulder, the actual body part shoulder, could be yeah would would be used metaphorically, but not the verbs of carrying. So body so body parts might be and heads and bellies are used a lot to just talk about things like confusion or upset or you know again that's quite common. But so but it's not the verbs of carrying. But I'll, that's a good point. Um, I, I will keep looking for that one. Do they play rugby? No 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 no. <laughs> I thought they would have to have a, a, a special game. No, the, they, there's a bit of there's a bit of um, f football, soccer. Yes. There's a bit of that, but that's all. No rules. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you made something looking at the video evidence about uh, the gestures. That is there. A okay. Is it sort of, yeah. Uh, cognitively ingrained in that way? Um, you know, one thing that came through, well, I don't think this quite answers your question, but your question gives me an opportunity to say this, which I think is worthwhile. Um, 
aside from the, you know, at the end putting it on the um, head, one thing that I only real, realised by doing the videoing um, is that the whole body is involved in in weaving, in weaving a basket. So I'm sorry I didn't include one of the photos, but I have a photo where part of the so the so the baskets are made from coconut leaves and they're stripped from the main thing. But there'd been the time when. Um, the person weaving would hold one end of it with their toes. So, that, so there's basically their feet are involved. Then there's um, there's also a stage where, say, for a string to, to sort of make a kind of string, they would roll it. They would roll it on their thigh. Um, they, they say that oh, some of the if you look at the basket. Um, if you look at the basket, the colouring in the basket that's just coconut leaf and it, that, that's green and the other part, the black part, has been blackened with a sort of um, a liquid um, from a certain nut and so there's also smoke, so, that's, so the smell both of the leaf and the smoke is involved. And I can't remember all of the other things they took, but oh, the, the, but they did. Once I said something about the feet, they said yes. We think everything, every part of your body is involved in weaving these things, and uh, the sound of the rustling of the coconut leaves and so on. So, so I think there's um, there's definitely more there's more there um, than I've kind of uh, looked at, and. Um, and I, I kind of see that as part of the, the gesture thing, but I don't have anything actually concrete to contribute beyond that. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah? Well, do you have any sort of cognate verbs to do with picking up heavy or light objects and whether they relate to the word? Uh, yes, a couple. One in particular. So the, um, the carry something in two hands, Sulua. That's, that, that assumes that it's, you're picking up a heavy object. Um, the toya carry something in the hand would assume that it's a small object and lots of, evident, lots of examples to show that it's sort of hand size. So there's that sort of thing. Okay, but, but, so, but they inherently also to pick up as well at the same time to carry something and transport it away or is that actually a of different verbs of picking up? Oh, okay. Um, on the whole, no. I mean, this the, the bottom one, pick something up, and yeah. th that, that can be used for just like, because it's, I think, also f to do with children. It is to do with children, but it's the picking, it can be used just to mean to pick up. But, but what is interesting is um, the verb sungi, sungia, the, the carry on your head. So I didn't, I said that these verbs don't behave in the same way in terms of things like reduplication and, and so on. So. If you if you reduplicate sungi, sungi sungi means to take something off your head and put it on the ground, to put down your so to take off, right? So I have talked about I had talked to someone about is there anything at that stage of, of, of you know location and, and, and so on, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, but that that's an interesting one that it, that reduplication is putting it down. Also in terms of reduplication, um, the reduplicated form of carry someone in a cloth on your side, TV, TV, TV refers to the cloth. So there's, you know, they're not, um, um, so, so another point is motion, I mean, it's not quite your question, but um, I have looked carefully at where motion is, um, is sits in the construct, is it in the, is it in the verb, is it in the construction, is it in the what? And motion seems to be part of the syntactic constructions that they, fit in. So all of these, ver I, I, should, I think all of these verbs can quite easily just be position and you then get the motion in the next clause. So the most typical way of using, I think most of the verbs, but the verbs that I've checked are um, to have one clause which says something like, um, I'll see if it might even have one here, maybe I don't have one here, I, don't, I won't look, but it's simply just to say carry verb, uh, somebody carry verb something or just carry verb and or coordinator they go and he goes so and verb of motion and he or, and flies so that's how so I think there's also evidence to say when you're going back to Talmi's kind of motion or location that needs to be very carefully um, um, argued for in any of these domains. Is it motion or location? Is it motion and location? Is it one or the other? So, so yeah, I, I don't think they, and, I, and the other thing is I don't think they all work the same, for sure, in that way. 
Um, so, yeah.